Uganda's third national development plan and how it affects your daily life. Then join us on Monday, March 27, 2023 at 10 p.m. on UBC for a special edition of Spotlight UG. We shall, among other things, be exploring the successes, opportunities and challenges presented by... Let's take a look at the first panelist. Dr. Asumani Gulova is an economist and development practitioner with over 20 years of professional experience. He is currently the Director of Development Planning at the National Planning Authority, NPA. He previously worked with the World Bank in Uganda and Zambia and the Parliament of Uganda. He also lectures the Masters of Economics and Master of Science Quantitative Economics programs of Makerere University. Before joining National Planning Authority, he was a country economist in the Macro and Fiscal Management, MA. FM, Global Practice GP of the World Bank, where he led, co-led, or coordinated the World Bank's economic program and activities in Zambia. Dr. Gulova holds a PhD in Economics, Public Finance and Financial Economics of the University of Dalasaram, Masters of Arts in Economics, Econometrics of the University of Dalasaram, and a Bachelor of Arts Honors in Economics from Makerere University. All right, uh, Dr. Suman, I would like to say assalamu alaikum and I hope the Ramadan is treating you well and you can say hello to our viewers. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Mildred, I'm happy to be here. Viewers, I'm very pleased to be here to share uh, a few words of development. Definitely not. There will not be few because this is going to be two hours, but as we start it off once again, let's take a look at our next panelist. <laughs> Dr. Rogers Mate is an economist and currently the Director of Research and Development Performance at the National Planning Authority, NPA. He previously served in acting capacity as the Deputy Executive Director at NPA. He was also a Manager, Macroeconomic Planning, Senior Macroeconomist and Senior Planner Economic Development at the Planning Authority. Dr. Mate previously worked with the National Population Council Secretariat, served as a Member of Parliament of the Republic of Uganda and senior economist for Kasese District. Dr. Mate is a council member of the National Population Council, Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, representing NPA, and he is a chairperson of the Technical Ad Hoc Subcommittee, Committee of the Council. He is also the chairperson of National Planning Authority, Staff Corporate Savings and Credit Society Limited. He is also secretary to the Privy Council of the Businga Bwarenzururu, a cultural institution and member of the University Council. Renzori International University, Kasese, Uganda. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Economics from Makerere University, a Master in Public Administration from Uganda Management Institute, a Master of Arts in Economic Policy and Planning, and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Makerere University. Yes, from the Directorate of Development Performance, we'll be looking at the fact that now we are in NDP3, uh, what has been the performance of one and two. But Dr. Matea, very good evening to you. Uh, just say hello to our viewers. Yes, good evening, viewers. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, we'll be sharing on the development of, of, of the country, mm. the performance over the past few years. And uh, I'll be glad to share with you what so far we have taken account of. And, Thank and, you. and whether very soon we'll go sh like uh, the minister at one point in time told us, but we'll be getting to that discussion. <laughs> All right. Let's take a look at our next panelist. <laughs> Honorable Wanyoto is the executive board member of the National Planning Authority, NPA, member of the APR panel of eminent persons of Africa peer review mechanism, APRM. She is also the chairman of the Women's League of the Ruling National Resistance Movement, NRM Political Party. She is a former member of the East African Legislative Assembly. She has also served as the deputy special representative of the chairperson of the African Union Commission, best in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia and Deputy.
Deputy of Head of Mission in Somalia, Honorable Lydia Wanyoto Mutende, holds a Bachelor of Law degree and a Bachelor of Education with Arts degree languages from Makerere University. She holds a Master's of Arts and Human Rights, a Master in International Studies and Diplomacy from the University of Nairobi, and Master of Women and Gender Studies. <laughs> And who best on the panel can discuss uh, issues of a key demography in our population, and that's the women, and what role and part they play in the development process of the country, the Honorable Lydia Wanyoto. A pleasure having you say hello to our viewers. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Mildred, and to the viewers and listeners. I'd like to wish all the Muslims in our country, especially the women, a very peaceful Ramadan, and I'm happy to be here to speak about our country's national plan, more especially in terms of where the women sit and stand mm -hmm. and also on governance issues because women constitute the biggest population of More our than country. 50%. Yes, about fifty one point five percent of the country's population. So we cannot wish away the role of the plan about women and in how the they are directly and indirectly affected by whatever plan it is. Positively they're called the files. They are, they are the ones that should be if, if you plan for the woman, then you plan for the country. Yeah, that's very true. And last in, uh, but no means the list, let's get to have our last panelist before we jet straight into the discussion. Mr. Charles Olenyi Ojok has over 28 years of experience in public service with hands-on experience in strategic leadership and management, project planning and management, organization, planning and management of social delivery systems, institutional governance, board affairs, partnerships development, stakeholder management and business advocacy and strategy. He currently serves as a Deputy Executive Director at the National Planning Authority, NPA, previously served as the Assistant Commissioner for the local economic development in the Ministry of Local Government. He also worked as a Secretary General at the National Chamber of Commerce and Industries, served as a Special Presidential Assistant in the Office of the President, Member of Parliament of the Republic of Uganda and Chairman and Member on several boards of directors for government companies and authorities. Mr. Olenyi holds a Master's of Arts in Social Sector Planning and Management with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Social Administration from Makerere University. And at that, our panel is fully constituted. Dr. Olini, I would like to just say hello to our viewers before we get into the discussion because we can't wait. Mr. Olen Charles is yes. the name. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, viewers. It's my pleasure as uh, part of the team from the National Planning Authority to share with the viewers the discourse on the development uh, planning perspectives in the country mm. and uh, particularly as the, the team responsible for development planning processes in the country, we are very pleased to be here. A pleasure. Probably I am speaking in, uh, as a prophet uh, to, to bestow upon you a title of Dr. <laughs> Pretty Son. Yes. But for those who are watching us, follow the discussion on all our social media platforms, including NBS TV social media platforms and UBC TV as social media platforms. In case you have any questions coming through, we'll be looking at those in the next few minutes. Let's keep <clears throat> that discussion uh, coming through. As it's already said, and I want to start off with you, I, I normally say ladies first unless where there is danger. <laughs> so I'll start with Honorable Lydia Wanyoto. Um, if you're given three hours to cut down a tree, you probably want to take the two planning on how you're going to execute that. That speaks to how important planning is, and that is why uh, we have the man that mandate taken under the National Planning Authority, but not so many Ugandans know what you are about, what you exactly do, and you, what you've probably done so far. If you could just take us through that a little bit, your mandate is National Planning Authority. The National Planning Authority is an institution which is a creature of the 1995 Constitution. It's one of the few institutions that are engraved in the, in the National Constitution. And then secondly, it's also a creature and its operations under an act of parliament, 2002. Um, the main thrust of this institution is to plan for the country. It's the national planner for the country. Mm. And um, 
Many people may not see the arm of the plant because normally the cooking is in the kitchen. Mm. We, are, when we, are, we are not normally out there to be seen that we are planning. And but whatever you see, serve. yes, the, whatever resources that you see, the estimates of the budget collection, the budget gaps, the fiscal space of our country, and the priorities drawn normally come from the plan. And the challenges you see when you have budget gaps is because we have uh, cooked the plan for a particular phase of the, of the time, and then sometimes maybe the resources may not be enough. But normally budgeting, and you'll hear from my colleagues, we've since gone away from uh, individual silo type budgeting to mm. program budgeting. If you're talking about water, it will be water either for self-human uh, consumption, whether it is for agriculture, uh, plantation, whether it is for livestock, it should be under one plan and then be dispensed from different ways. So planning is going to be uh, program based, but it has its history. If you remember from the plan of uh, that came before us of uh, 2040, you've always heard about that uh, vision 2040. Yeah, it's the story of where is Uganda coming from, where is Uganda now, and where is Uganda going. So vision 2040 has been cut in two phases of, you heard about the national plan one, NDP national development plan one, then we had two, then we, ha we are now concluding on three and we're doing reviews. And during uh, difficult times that dis distract our plans, like the recent uh, lockdown and COVID-19, we are able to do the modeling so that we are able to refocus the plan of the country a factor into the fluctuations and the challenges of resources and the flow of the economy so that we prepare the country and the leadership on the tracking and be able to guide. So that's the plan of the country and that's why we exist. Uh, we are not so much into uh, shouting because the plan goes along with the, uh, <coughs> policy statements of every ministry. Mm. If you find the sectors going to parliament to ask for of any budget here, or medium expenditure review, MTFs, you'll find that there is a plan alongside, and that is guided by the National Planning Authority. The, it is the think tank of the country okay. that guides the country how it should go and how we should be able to dispense whatever resources in terms of money, human capital, aspirations of the country, and how they look like. In every sector, there is the arm of the plan, and the technical arm of the country is, comes from the National Planning Authority as a think tank for the country. So we are the overarching eye that oversees how the country's economy should be running. And we send out triggers. We also send mm. out warning, early warning. I remember we quite send a out number in COVID. We, we, Our work is told them, this is how we are moving. Instead of going to Roro, you are wavering off to Busia, come back to the line. Our work is to guide, is to advise, and it is to give, to give statistical information. And we do not work alone. We work with other sister agencies like UBOS to get okay. facts mm. and figures and other areas and technical people. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll definitely be coming back to you. Dr. Matei, before we even go to NDP3, which we're currently almost winding up, like Honorable Wanyoto has said, she talked about an aspect of research. She talked about the statistics and numbers. We are in number three. That means there was number one and number two. I'd like you to just take us back a little bit on... Uh, the theme number one, because I know all these national development plans, they are themized. Uh, there is a particular focus that you are looking at and whether that has been achieved and then you get to progress on to the second one. What did NDP 1 and 2 look like? And did they espouse what you wanted to achieve? And when I say you, I'm looking at the entire National Planning Authority together with the country as Uganda. Just take us back a little bit. Uh, thank and you. and flip, feel free to flip that and um, switch it to your own comfort. Yes. Uh, N N NDP1 uh, was put in place uh, from 2010 to 2014-15. Then NDP2 uh, covered the period 2015-16, 2019-20. Now, of course, that is part of the vision framework because the vision framework requires us to produce uh, six plans in order to achieve the vision, the, the transformation we want to, to, to see, mm. uh, for us to transit from uh, a subsistence to a modern and pro prosperous economy. We needed to have six uh, national development plans, each of five years. 
So we carried out uh, evaluation, f final evaluation of, of NDP1, and then uh, identified lessons. Of course, we realized that each time, each time we were coming up with a plan, we had experiences uh, such as shocks that moved us away from our, our targets. Mm. You remember mm -hmm. around 2008, 20, 20, 20, mm. we, we had just had the financial crisis in the global world. Sure. But the effects of that glob global crisis manifested in the country around the time we were also putting in place NDP1. Similarly, when we were putting in place NDP2, uh, we, we again had uh, similar challenges. One of the uh, challenges we, we, that was manifested is that we had planned to have a stable uh, macroeconomy, macro environment, but one of the shocks we had was so our exchange rate change from 2,500 to about 3,000 in just one year. Now, such shocks uh, posed a great challenge to our development that we would not maintain uh, our course of development over time. So we had to look at the lessons uh, from that kind of experience when we were coming up with NDP3. Mm. So we looked at the performance uh, in terms of the uh, the level, the, 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 the standards of living of the, of the people, we looked at the income levels, we looked at the, the way we were exploiting our uh, available opportunities, and then decided that for NDP3, we needed to have a goal that focuses on increasing incomes, uh, but also improving the quality, uh, the, the welfare of the population. Yeah. But that that should be um, along the industrial industrialization theme, along the industrialization path, because we, we thought that with industrialization, which is linked to our uh, potentials, especially uh, the, 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 the resources we have, such as in agriculture, uh, in the, the mineral wealth, uh, tourism, uh, and other resources, that we would be in a position to look at value chains of, of these opportunities. And then given that we know where our population lies, yeah. our biggest population was in uh, agriculture. So if we look at the value chains of agri key agriculture commodities and add value, then we would be able to move faster uh, in increasing uh, incomes. But at the same time, we have the factor, our key important factor which is the the human beings the population if you see the population is supposed to be part of the production uh, processes in the inputs and input mm. if you have capital uh, you have other factors population is also supposed to be a factor but you need you need to build it so if we build our human capital and then uh, use it improve its productivity and use it to uh, added to the capital that we have in exploiting the, the resources that we have in agriculture, in, in manufacturing, in, in uh, general, general industry, in tourism, uh, and the other resources, we would be able to pick up growth, which we lost uh, due to the shocks in the previous two plans. Okay. So that is the reason why, uh, when you look at uh, how we, we categorize our sources of growth, like if you look at the five objectives of our NDP3, mm. you will see that objective one is related to adding value to the uh, resources that we have. Objective two is, uh, in, uh, is aimed at making sure that the private sector plays a greater role in job creation. Objective uh, three uh, is aimed at um, m making sure that we, we use the infrastructure we have already developed, uh, consolidates what we have uh, achieved and add on so that we can reduce the cost of doing business ac across the country. Uh, then objective um, five, object, objective, uh, objective four, four is on uh, the human capital because we said that human, we have the biggest resource as Population. population. So we need to invest in that population and turn it into capital. 
so that it can be useful for development. Okay. And then the last objective is to do with increasing the role of, of government, of the public sector, in making sure that uh, the rest of the economy functions more efficiently. So we, like, we invest in uh, key areas where the private sector has not devoted its focus, uh, and we use our arm, investment arm, such as the Uganda Development uh, Corporation, uh, and, and the other areas we generate more revenue and invest it in those other areas where the private sector would not be able to invest. Okay. So those five areas, therefore, would help us uh, move along a path of industrialization and achieve faster uh, increases in, in income as well as uh, improve our welfare. All right, I see NDP3 building on more of rather resilience and trying to absorb those shocks and move forward. But I'll be coming back to that and some of the points as you raised. Mm -hmm. Let me go to Mr. Charles Soleni on the, just a sneak peek into NDP3, which we're almost winding up. And to some, it could be a surprise. To some, they could have been following. And, and what so far we seem to be seeing as the highlights as we get closer to the 20, um, I, I mean, 2025, which is the last financial year where we'll be closing off this and say, now let's move on to the next uh, national development plan phase. So what are some of the highlights of this third phase or the third national development plan? Uh, thank you very much, Mildred. I, I just uh, feel it's uh, critical for me at this point to share with the viewers where we are coming from in terms of development planning for the country. Uh, way back... In uh, 2007, as a country, we approved and adopted what we refer to as the Comprehensive National Development Planning Framework. Now, this framework is what we anchor our planning on. And I would like just to quickly mention the key aspects of this framework. Mm -hmm. As we plan for the development of our country, <coughs> we are guided by what the, under the UN system was agreed, and we, we call it uh, the UN Agenda 2030, which uses the Sustainable Development Goals as our overarching targets for us to achieve. Mm. Then you come down to the continental aspirations as contained in African Agenda 2063. It has aspirations that embody uh, the, the people in the continent. You come down to the East African region where we are informed as we draw our planning we are informed by the ESC or the East African Community Agenda 2050. And then most importantly, we come down to the document that colleagues have already been uh, alluding to, and this is our own uh, Ugandan aspirations as contained in the Vision 2040. Now, in addition to this, we also as we plan for the development of the country. Very importantly, <coughs> integrate the manifesto of the ruling government. And over and above, planning being a dynamic process, we are also guided by the presidential directives during the course of uh, the implementation of the plan. Now, have it, having just shared with you what informs our planning? I would like to quickly again say, why do we plan? We need to plan because as uh, a country, we have inadequate resources. Sure. We must efficiently use these resources. And we have social economic goals that must be achieved for the good and the better welfare of the population. So planning becomes very, very important. We need to talk about growth. We need to talk about poverty reduction. We need to talk about increasing 
the incomes of our population, which is actually the, the goal of the third development plan, and so on and so forth. Now, having said so, I would like to again inform the, the viewers that what then is a plan? A plan, simply put, is a document that has been agreed to us through a process of consultations with all the, stake <coughs> all the stakeholders. You talk about uh, the, the private sector, you talk about the academia, you talk about the population itself, uh, you, you, you talk about uh, the civil society organizations and so on and so forth, all the stakeholders. This document is then uh, what National Planning Authority collects and we use it therefore to guide the interventions and the public investments on of government for the greater uh, good of the population. Now specifically coming to the third development plan, I would like to observe that uh, as you did raise NDP, the National Development Plan 1 and 2, focused majorly on addressing the key binding uh, you know, constraints that had, through the years, had bedeviled our development process. We also, in addition, uh, dealt with the structural constraints and, and difficulties that faced uh, our economy. You are talking about high inflation, high, high debts, you are talking about to high levels of poverty and so on and so <coughs> forth. Of course, uh, not forgetting to mention the high unemployment levels among the youth. So all of these are the issues that the, every plan aspires to address. Now, specifically for the third development plan, it, its goal was to increase the household incomes and improve the welfare of Ugandans. That's why, Midrid, I think it's important to just run through some of the key highlights. My colleague, Dr. Mate, has already taken uh, the viewers through the, the five key objectives, objectives of this plan. So I don't need to repeat that. But allow me quickly to observe that uh, the, the third development plan introduced some very key reforms uh, in the planning process. And the most importantly to note was the introduction of the program-based approach to planning, uh, budgeting, and implementation. The focus of the, the reform was ideally to clean up the planning process, but also implementation. Re remove uh, duplication and wastage. <coughs> And uh, uh, for a long time, we had been observing the challenges that were caused by the silo approach, where every agency was like almost implementing without recognizing the input of other the implementers. Yeah. Yeah. So the key reform that the NDP3 uh, brought on board was to remove that wastage and focus on results. We therefore recognize that for every result that we, we hope to achieve, <coughs> there can be a number of interventions. And these interventions can be by different stakeholders. In our case, we now re re refer to them as ministries, departments, and agencies, and so on. So all of this can contribute to achieving the common results. That's one of the key aspects of the, the NDP3. The other one is also to mention that the third development plan looked at balancing the, the regional uh, development. Here there was an, an element of uh, equity in uh, as far as development is concerned. That's why you'll find within the program, within the plan, we introduced what is referred to as the regional development program, which aims at addressing uh, the inequities that are characterized by some of the regions, for instance, Karamoja, Teso, <coughs> Busoga, Bukedi, uh, Bunyoro, and so on and so forth, whose poverty indicators were found to be 
below the national average. So that needed uh, specific interventions. And indeed, most of these, uh, uh, what you know as affirmative actions, were anchored on that to balance regional development. Midrid and uh, viewers, you will also note that uh, of significance is now the parish development model. Our new baby on the in, in, in the implementation <laughs> of the NDP3, yes. <clears throat> the PDM, as we abbreviate it, was uh, found to be a vehicle that was going to be used for the delivery of implementation. Here, we are looking at taking both planning, implementation, and monitoring of government delivery of services to the parish level. So that's why you find that uh, it has, uh, the, the, the PDM has uh, uh, seven pillars. The one that has been now rolled out is really the one of financial inclusion. Mm. But there are others uh, which w will be uh, operationalized as soon as uh, government is able to. Now, under the, the current financial inclusion pillar, which is of course headed by uh, the Minister of Finance working together with uh, the Ministry of Local Government and the PDM uh, Secretariat, some huge uh, progress has been registered. We are aware of funds that have been now released to the parish uh, development uh, special purpose vehicles, that's the circles, but not to all of them yet. And that's a very small, like, um, a, a very small percentage. And, and, and I would like to come in there, sorry for interrupting yeah. you, that you, uh, early alone, um, um, Dr. Mate talked about research. And, and clearly what came out around uh, last year was that you both clearly stated that there wasn't clear 100% statistics for who were going to be the beneficiaries. And this was the exact point that the PSST also said, I am not releasing monies because I do not have these statistics. Um, can you tell Ugandans right now that at planning level we have the statistics of the households and the exact beneficiaries of persons who are going to be receiving the PDM cash? Yeah, now, uh, Mildred, this is uh, an issue that was never going to be solved by UBOS alone. It was never going to be solved by National Planning Authority alone. It was never going to be solved by uh, the, the implementing agency, that is uh, the, the Minister of Finance and local government themselves. But what has happened so far, the Ministry of uh, ICT and National Guidance is the leader in as far as the collection of oh, data is concerned. Okay. Uh, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics, for which I am glad to inform the viewers that I sit on the board, sure. uh, representing National Planning Authority, has been very uh, keenly involved, and they lead all of us in the field in terms of the collection of data, which data is then forwarded to Uganda Bureau of Statistics for processing. Now, uh, National, uh, National Planning Authority is working together with uh, UBOS for purposes of guiding the collection of the statistics. But I must tell you that, uh, and all the viewers, that we haven't been able to obtain all the necessary statistics as far as what would be required in terms of every parish. Mm. But it was viewed that this was going to be work in progress. We were never going to say we have now excellent statistics. We have some uh, statistical data which is able to uh, let the ministry responsible, especially finance, uh, release the funds. And on understanding that the parishes which have now been given the parish uh, development uh, guidelines are going to be part and parcel of this process. So it's going to be work in progress. The country needs to know that so far 
a lot of work has continued to happen. The circles at the parish level are busy uh, recruiting and training the members of the various uh, circle groups with the view of preparing them for how to receive the, the funds. Of course, you must also uh, understand that the, the constitution of the circles at the parish level is based on the enterprises. Now, I have had the personal experience that when I called uh, a meeting of the, the parish uh, development circle in my own parish, I found out that they have about five uh, enterprises. They had the Pigare, they had uh, cassava, they had the poultry, they had uh, uh, goat keeping, and also others had gone for uh, sorghum growing. Now, this is going to be the same in all the other parishes. What is important is for this training and sensitization to happen at the parish level. Okay. So that at the point of disbursing the funds, you ought to have clearly agreed on what enterprise is good for the individual who is going to be supported. Okay. And I also like to agree with uh, the current process in which the, the circles have preferred to choose up to about five enterprises alone. That means uh, out of the 30 or so people, it could now mean that there is uh, economies of scale where you have about six members going into a similar enterprise or one enterprise. Mm. That would therefore uh, prepare the country uh, to achieve the increased productivity that we hope to gain uh, from uh, financing and operationalizing the circles at that level. Okay, I'll be coming back to you. I know there is still a lot to talk about in, yeah. in, under NDP3, but allow me go to Dr. Suman on so far some of the successes out of the national development plans that we've had one, two, and now three, which is almost coming to um, coming to an end. What successes, what lessons are we taking from these plans that we've so far concluded with? Uh, Mildred, thank you. I think before I start, I normally want to tell viewers this. Yes. Uh, from the planning and adenage, we normally say those who want, who want to fail, don't plan. Basically, we say those who don't plan, plan to fail. Mm. I wanted to start from that context because everything I'm going to be talking about is within that line. Now, if you look at uh, where we are now as a country, uh, starting from where my colleague started from, is we are currently implementing the third national development plan. Sure. This plan is actually building on other plans. From other plans that we pick the successes from the NDP1 and NDP2 and consolidate them. And that's what came in NDP3. Now, we also learn from the lessons that we have seen from NDP1 and NDP2. I'll, be, I'll give you one or two things. One, is uh, if you look at uh, NDP2, mm. the main uh, catchword at that time was uh, middle income status. Mm -hmm. But uh, you and me, you know, middle income status is just income, middle income or income per capita. It's just an average. It's a summative. A summative. The you get, uh, if you get uh, a few people on the top, so there is on the type, they can pull up everybody and we say everybody is well off. Now, learning from that, in NDP theory, we said, no, it's not just about talking about the, the averages. We need to talk about the common person. And that's why, if you look at that commonality of the person, it looked at uh, uh, trying to go household income. I'll be going to that in detail. But to come to the successes, is what are we building on this? I'll give you an example. For instance, when we went in NDP theory, and said, as we are looking at household income, how do we ensure that if we implement this plan, if everything had gone well without COVID, we are aspiring that at least in the five years, majority and average, most Ugandans should be sight aware of. At least if not the income doubling, should be much, much better. And that's where my colleague was talking about PDM. 
PDM now, instead of looking at middle income at the averages, you needed an implementation tool that looks at the people. The household. The household. And that's where price development model is looking at the people. Second issue that we learned from the other plans to this plan and the success is, one, in terms of infrastructure, if you look at uh, NDP1, uh, it was impossible to drive a, traverse any part of the country without potholes in the road. Now you can traverse from uh, Malava all the way to Katuna border. The only challenge you will be facing is traffic jam. Which People we need in the to sort CBD out. will not be happy with yeah. you when you talk uh, about potholes, yeah. but that will be a story. Yeah, it, that's that. another point. <laughs> but I could yes. pass through the northern bypass and bypass CBD yeah. and then off all the way to to, to it. But uh, sure. you are getting where I'm going. Yeah. The second thing in terms of success is uh, for those of us who are slightly old, you, you notice that uh, in 2007, uh, electricity. I'm telling you, it would, it would have been impossible for us to complete this program mm. without road shedding. If we would have survived, then would be a few people who have generators who would be watching us. Majority of people would, be, would not be watching us. Now we are faced with a different problem. The different problem is that, uh, it's an iron actually, is that uh, now you have electricity that you are paying for people not using it. Surplus. So meaning that uh, with that kind of success, uh, the next dispension of trying, we need an out focus. We have built the foundations within which to, to, to try to start focusing development towards the individual. And it's because of that that uh, when we talked about the goal of the plan to be increasing household income and wealth of the people, the theme was industrialization. Mm. Meaning that uh, now that you have laid the foundation of infrastructure in place, the right electricity in place, doesn't matter the price. But at least is in place. Now, the next thing is that how do you create jobs to bring people where they are? So the, the issues that were started unpacking were building on those successes to mm -hmm. make sure that um, now you need to focus more on jobs uh, to ensure that uh, majority of people are getting uh, a little bit more. And in industrialization now came naturally because if you, had, you, you were having a, a situation of road shedding, you can't talk about industry. So now that you have enough electricity, you have uh, a few roads that can evacuate the products that you are producing to the market. We, we need it now to focus to ensure that our people get better jobs. Are they able to, to focus on the market? Mm. And from that, from the, what the colleagues talked about, that uh, you can talk of the opportunities within this plan. Mm -hmm. And these, pl these opportunities do not only come from the goal, they do not only come from the theme, they are traverse a, a, along the entire 20 programs of the plan. And I'll, gi I'll mention one or two or three. In agro-industrialization, in agro-industrialization, the focus was we faced this problem. The problem is that our subsistence sector was 68%. How do we reduce it? And how do you ensure that the people who are the majority of Ugandans, currently 64% of Ugandans, uh, are in the agriculture sector, it contributes only 24% of GDP. So the irony is here is that uh, the 64% are, are sharing in the 24% of GDP. So if you do, do a, a bit of math, simple math, definitely they are getting a small cake. Now, to unpack, to ensure that these people get more, we started looking at the entire problem of agriculture. In NDP2, the lesson we learned is that when we are looking at agriculture, we are looking at it from one end, production. People, people, you promise people, then people overproduce. The maize comes to the market all of a sudden. Flooded. They, it's Friday, the prices are almost at a giveaway price. We said, get, we need to, to have a, a stop at that. What do we need to do? We need to unpack what we now refer to as the entire value chain. The value chain of agriculture starts from research. You go to production. You do post-harvesting. Because if you are aware, Mildred, are you aware that... Uh, 30% of agriculture GDP is lost because of post-service po handling. Sure. So now, if you are to, so, to just, it's naturally, therefore, is that if you are to improve just household incomes in, in agriculture, you need to sort out that post-service handling. Now, if you deal with the post-service handling, the next thing would be is that instead of our people exporting most of the amazing Kenyan raw form, getting raw prices, how do we ensure that these people 
build a bit of value addition on that and uh, and then get them the right markets now it's because of that that when you come to your parish development model that's where the, you connect the dots the dots are is that uh, once we have given them inputs and they have a bit of little money to buy the right inputs for production then at the next level at parish level they should be able to add a bit of value so that at the end of the day if you get them the right markets the the money in people's pockets will definitely increase this the next opportunities in uh, i'll give you an, another example it's in tourism you know tourism is uh, a very big game changer uh, currently if we before covid actually it was uh, around the biggest income earner for this country but uh, in terms of jobs everybody could be could be employed in tourism and this is what happens worldwide you could have a, a uber for tourists when they are coming in you could the people in karamoja could use the culture of karamoja to create uh, tourism then it, it, this your country is so beautiful the culture is so diverse so what we're we saying here is that um, two things you needed to do in tourism is that we try to build uh, more products in tourism how can we sell our culture how can we develop the tourist attractions we have? How can we ensure that a tourist, when he comes in Uganda, uh, he, he, sp he spends a little bit more money in Uganda? Currently, most tourists, when they come for conferences, they go back with their dollars. But we want to build a product that whereby when this person comes, the amount of money lives in Uganda is a little bit more. Mm. The second issue is that build, behind building that product of tourism, we need to, to unpack the issues related to marketing this tourism as a country and start attracting the right tourists. Currently, okay. Uganda's tourism numbers equal to Kenya, but the quality of our tourists, Kenyans are, are better. Because majority of Ugandans, people are coming here, are coming to visit friends, uh, they come and stay and spend a little bit of money and they go back, so they're not leaving enough dollars. For Kenya, the majority of people are coming there are serious business. So the conversation you're having there is how do we change that conversation, hmm. this pension? And uh, more importantly is how do we market this country in that uh, forefront? So that once you deliver that, anybody can wake up and be able to tap into that market. Okay. The uh, third, yes. I have, uh, 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 we have uh, several, is that in this plan, we try to focus more on the private sector. Why? It's again, it doesn't take a lot of mathematics to understand this because the private sector is the biggest employer. You are aware, Midrange, yes. you are you employed in the Uganda private sector. Uganda is a private sector led economy. That yeah. is what yeah. we focus 80%, on. 80% of Ugandans are employed by the private sector. It pays 80% of the taxes. The problem is that majority of the private sector is informal sector. It's a small business. They are struggling where they are. How do we ensure that they grow? How do we ensure that instead of uh, government policing them, it helps them build them up? So issues related to UDB, issues related to, to microfinance support center, including PDM itself, is basically to ensure we harness that private sector. And as government, we try to bring in uh, ways of harnessing and building them to go together. Uh, you know what? Now, the other w opportunity and w something that we learned, and this came in strongly after COVID. Um, when COVID came in, it came in at the time when we were uh, about to launch this plan and COVID hit us. Uh, the beauty is that uh, within this plan, we are struggling to come up with a program, the program of digital transformation. COVID hits us and all of a sudden it's like we're <laughs> profits. Meaning we are pushing for digital transformation now everything else became digitalization uh majority of tv now are no longer majority people watch us now on their phones mm. people don't need to go to offices there are some offices where now people work just six by virtue of 60 percent of the time they work away from home so meaning the conversation is totally changing but for government in particular is that if we are to deliver the service delivery more efficiently more cheaply particularly in, in times where we don't have resources. Digitalization is the way to go. Mm. Uh, you, you don't need the uh, uh, health workers everywhere. You don't need extension workers everywhere. If you have e extension, 
all, all, all farmers with the right gadgets, they could be able to access the right advice wherever they are. So this in itself improves the way government does business, and this was thought about in the plan, and it, we, we are prioritizing it going forward. Okay. Uh, maybe before I come, what one more issue that my colleagues have been talked about that will be very important is the issue of urbanization. And it's more to the portals you are talking about in Kampala. Now, one thing we realize is that if we are to improve incomes and we are to improve the well-being of Ugandans, is there is some low-hanging fruit that we, we haven't harnessed. And this is urbanization. How can we make sure that the engines of growth in this country can come from urbanization? One example I'll give you is Kampala City, great, Greater Kampala metropolitan area. Are you aware that uh, the entire GDP of this country, non-agriculture GDP, Kampala alone contributes 65% of that GDP? But this is uh, a cow that we are milking, that we haven't uh, harnessed very well. So to answer your question back and to put back, what, how do we ensure that we reduce the traffic jams? How do we ensure that um, we deliver uh, people go to, to, to town to work smoothly, smoothly and they don't waste a lot of time in the jam. Because currently, the GDP we waste just traversing from one place to the other. Uh, on an average, every Ugandan who works in the city raises about three hours, productive sure. hours in the mm. jam. Mm. So if we are to sort out that out alone, it will greatly improve household incomes. That's why you are seeing uh, us having conversation on uh, Kampala flyovers, these are part of uh, NDP projects that we are trying to do. You, you are starting to see how the city is being beautified in terms of traffic lights. We have worked on uh, what we call the GKM strategy to ensure that uh, we are able to harness this uh, uh, cow so that we, we, we fatten it for it to give us more work. But not only that, mm. but there are also these other cities that were pronounced. We are going to full front to make sure how do we plan for these cities for them to be able to deliver the jobs that we look for. Do, do we have blueprints of the plans for those particular cities? Because we should be saying now about two years, and, yeah. and for many of the cities looking at the growth, looking at the development, it's more on paper than in actualization. Did we have this before, or are we starting to plan for these cities right about now? No, it's it, what I normally say, better late than never. So while some of these plans were not uh, comprehensive as you want, we are having that conversation. We are trying to push to have up to come up with each of these cities' plans. And the beauty with it that some, if you are late come up, for these new cities that are coming in, with the right plans, physical development plans in place that we are trying to spearhead, then they will they will make uh, uh, not fall in the pitfalls that Kampala has fallen into. Mm. And these plans are, are in high gear that are being built now to ensure that they inform the way we are going to move as cities. Okay. Yeah. I, I will be getting back to you. Honorable Lydia Wanyoto, a, a key aspect that stands out in NDP3 is industrialization, which is a great deal. We're thinking about jobs. We're thinking about, um, you know, agro-processing and adding value to our products. But key to it is the environment. And, and it's great that this is a month where Uganda also marked uh, the National Water and Environment Week. Are we planning, looking at the environment? Because um, issues of global warming, issues of fumes that come from industries have remained center stage in the discussions globally, not only in Uganda. How is Uganda in itself, you know, faring with the discussion of, yes, we want the industrialization, but how are we looking at our environment? Uh, Uganda has a, a very big opportunity to not only to maintain the best environment in the world because we have very good weather and uh, we have not yet polluted the environment compared to other uh, industrialized countries. We are just planning to industrialize now. So what is important is to grow a culture of how to do waste management because even the basics of plastics, we haven't been able to do it well, but we need to grow it right from families and how they dispose, even in kitchen waste, Look at the health centers, how they uh, dispose of the biological waste. These are basics we should grow with in schools, in families, but also in authorities. Um, my colleague has talked about urbanization. Mm. Uganda, because of electricity, 
and other utilities like water and communication internet, many villages are turning into small urban centers. And when people gather in one place, it talks about settlement. Everywhere there is settlement, there must be the component of waste management. Because when people settle, there is also waste management. And, and this one we haven't been doing very well because in the past, uh, most of the country was really like 60 70 percent rural where you can uh, now waste throw waste in the garden and there was no so much um, Degradable waste, but now we have plastics. We have biological waste. We have a lot of waste from electronics You know, you know people like you maybe they use phones for one month Then there's a new one which has come these are iPhones. I don't know you could keep throwing them. Where are we? Uh, wasting. Uh, where, where are we managing the waste that comes with electronics? Electronics have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, pollutions that come with it. They can be pollute the environment because of the metal and all that comes with it. We are importing a lot of second-hand electronics and and vehicles and and fridges. All these uh, electronic gadgets that come to our country. We should not allow Uganda or East Africa as a region to be a dumping place for electronics because whether they are phones or fridges or vehicles or radios, they, 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 they come with a lot of pollution that can affect us when they finally get into the water system. Uganda is a lucky country that has a lot of water. Every few kilometers of our country, whether you are going east, west or north, you will cross a river or you'll cross a water body. Then most of our boundaries in Uganda, uh, international boundaries in our country, are, are closed off by water bodies, like Lake Victoria, Lake Edward, Lake George, up the Nile, goes through the border. So we, we are lucky that we have borders. So we should be able to, to keep our water bodies fresh and uh, utilize what we call, uh, we, in the plan, we're talking about the blue economy. We should not continue looking at water bodies, whether it's water, well, uh, River Nile or Lake Edward or George or Choga or Lake Victoria, as just uh, where our grandparents used to, Lake Bunyoni, where people just used to go for fishing with, and then crossing in terms of transport with small boats. We should be able to harness our water bodies in terms of uh, the blue economy. How can we harness the water in Uganda as a blue economy, but also sustain it, and also use it as a transport, as a, as a communication facility, in terms of transporting and easing the road infrastructure by putting maybe cargo on the water bodies? Because we, every board of our country has a water body, mm. but harness the water as a blue economy. How are we harnessing the water alone? We have so much water in Uganda. Apart from fishing, what else can we do to ensure that uh, we do maybe water tourism? We can do tourism, we can do so many transportation, we can do a lot of things because we are land uh, connected to, to service South Sudan, to service DRC, and to service Rwanda and Burundi, but also other parts of uh, up north to Ethiopia and South Sudan. Okay. So I wanted to say that uh, we can build a culture of, uh, of managing the environment, especially on the issues of waste, but also the, 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 the culture of afforestation because we have already cut down most of the if you drive along i come from bugisu if you drive along mabida whenever we are going home you find that along the the, the mabida forest it looks a bit like it is thick but inside it is empty so we have cut our, uh, we've cut down most of the trees but we have not replanted so we need to do a lot of uh, frustration campaign and fortunately we have uh, institutions like national forest authority the nfa and, and ministry that of environment that, that, that the, so the institutions are there, the laws are there, the policies are there, and the plan is there. We have planned for how we can harness but also maintain uh, the environment the and fight the story of the climate change. The climate we should not be victims of bad climate change. Where is the problem, uh, Honorable Lady Wanyoto? If you talk about these um, MDs the problem being is enforcement. The is, is the enforcement of uh, the policies that we have that you cannot just cut away trees without planting and that you need a license to be in terms of the timber business but how many people in uganda have timber business and how many people are enforcing it okay and then there is also the issue of energy they're using they're using firewood for charcoal and firewood for fuel but we need to look at what maybe, maybe we should do as we harness other energy 
renewable energy and the other energies we should be able to save uh, timber from being used for fuel and because we are also urbanizing coming out of the villages we should be able to plant more trees I, I, I said I come from Bugisu. We have the issues of the mudslide in areas like Bududa and Bulambuli. It's not because they are traditional like that. It's because we have been able, we have uh, abused those uh, highlands and removed all the trees and uh, and the green cover. And therefore, we are paying a price of uh, abusing the nature. So we should plant as much as maintain the environment and be able to harness, but a lot of awareness. Has been. These government institutions and agencies, their work is to actually run out uh, awareness campaigns, but also enforcement in terms of the degradation of the environment and waste management. Okay, and the mindset of Ugandans. Dr. Yes. Mate, I want to come to you. On the issue of agro-industrialization, still related to what Honorable Lydia was talking about, a great idea because 68% of Ugandans are in agriculture, millions of households that are um, gaining from there. But when we talk about agro-industrialization with our land tennis system, the president has consistently talked about land fragmentation, that's one, but also who owns this land where we're planning to plant all the products that we're going to be able to add value to, less than 30%. That's even too high. Less than 20% of Uganda's land is titled. That means there are issues of ownership coming through. But, but also, um, looking at our seasons, we are depending on the rains. The rains come two months, three months. So in a nutshell, half of the year, Ugandans are idle because they're waiting for the rains. And half of the year is when they're working, where there is either less quality production or even the production when it comes, um, it, 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 it is entirely imbalanced. How are we planning for all this when most of our industrialization agenda is planted on agriculture? Agro-industrialization, uh, of course, considers that we will be able to link the agriculture enterprises to industrial activity so that we can be able to process whatever comes from from the agriculture as inputs but processed in in the industries now in order for us to increase production so that we have enough that is uh, can that can run uh, the industries we are looking at uh, increasing acreage for those areas where they still land. Of course, not every, every part of the country uh, has limited land. There are some areas where it's already fragmented, but there are some other parts of the country where there's still uh, huge chunks of land that's not utilized, so it can be mechanized. So we are thinking of mechanizing in those areas, uh, and that's why there are programs such as uh, those where they would like to provide tractors uh, in communities where they still land. But in addition to that, provide uh, support for irrigation in those areas where there's land. If you look at water for irrigation, uh, what we had planned to achieve was about 55, about 55 million cubic uh, cubic meters of water in terms of about 44 million cubic meters in terms of capacity by the time of uh, our recent midterm review of, of the NDP3. Now we still need more effort to do uh, to provide storage capacity for irrigation, uh, bulk water supply, but uh, besides that we can also do irrigation at small scale for those that have small pieces of land. You can actually in improve productivity on small pieces of land uh, and increase yield if you use scientific methods of farming. So, How many Ugandans are able to get to that? Currently, there are few that are using uh, modern methods of farming. That's why under the agro-industrialization program, mm. particularly uh, under agriculture, the promotion of those technologies is part of the of the activities of the interventions and it's also done together with the the ministry of water ministry of agriculture and ministry of water work together to promote the appropriate technologies for irrigation both for small scale but also for large scale we have uh, some irrigation schemes there are a number of irrigation schemes that are operational and there are a number that are under plan uh, and if all of them 
uh, functional would be able to produce enough that can supply some of the industries under agroindustrialization. So, and of course, uh, colleagues have indicated that we need to go agroindustrialization because we know that that's an area where we can uh, generate more employment. Uh, we generated about we generated about uh, three, three roughly 330,000 jobs uh, in the recent two years on average per year, but our target was about uh, 520,000 per year according to our plan, and majority of those would come from agriculture. Currently, that's where most of the people uh, are engaged, and therefore, if we create more activity where they are. Uh, and improve their productivity, then it means that they will be able to produce more, which can feed into the industries. Actually, there is some, some uh, there's indication that some uh, results are coming up. We have observed in the recent uh, surveys that the population in agriculture, which we, we are tending to attribute to rising productivity, the population has come down from 68 to about 61 percent, but there has been an increase in the population now in industry uh, from about 7 percent to about 14 percent, and the mm. rest are in services. Mm. Now, the thinking was that <clears throat> when productivity improves in agriculture, people, will, the workers, in, some of their workers in agriculture will leave and go to industry and services a trend we are, we are tending to see now. What, what uh, we were interested in seeing is whether we shall be able to sustain it over the next few years. So if we can consolidate those gains, then we will be sure that productivity is improving in agriculture, okay. and therefore we can be able to sustainably supply industry. I love that you actually emphasize the aspect of sustainability because that's the most important of all the discussions that we're having. Mm -hmm. But ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll have to break this off at this point in time. Take a very short breather. Uh, you are still watching Spotlight Uganda broadcasting to you live from uh, uh, the next conference center here at NBS Television, the next media park. But we're also uh, broadcasting live on Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, Inspiring Uganda. Let's get back with more discussions about what a national development plan look like or where we've been and where we are currently with the NDP3. Curious about Uganda's third national development plan and how it affects your daily life? Then join us on Monday, March 27, 2023 at 10 p.m. on UBC for a special edition of Spotlight UG. We shall, among other things, be exploring the successes, opportunities and challenges presented by the NDP3's goal to increase household incomes and improve the quality of life for Ugandans under the fee. Building a brighter future together, exploring the third national development plan and its impact on the lives of Ugandans. Don't miss this chance to learn about how we all can play a part in our motherland's development. Tune in to Spotlight UG on UBC this Monday, March 27, 2023 at 10 p.m. to catch the panel discussion live. Join the hashtag online via hashtag Spotlight UG. With freedom. Get MTN Freedom Voice Bundles that don't expire. Dial star 100 star 21 hash or my MTN app for more bundles. Together, we're unstoppable. This isn't just a girl. She is the future. This is a teacher, a doctor, a community leader, our future president. She is our family's pride, and as her father, I will protect her from child marriage and talk to her about the dangers of teenage pregnancy. We each have a role to play in empowering our teenage girls to protect them from child marriage and pregnancy because when we empower them, we empower our nation. Protect the girl, save the nation. Take action. Report any case of defilement or child marriage to the police or call Saudi 116. Tania, 
success of supporting health in Uganda. This year, the Kabaka birthday run will mark its 10-year anniversary on Sunday, 16th April at Lubini, starting 7 a.m. And continue the fight to end AIDS by 2030. Buy your running kit today at 20,000 shillings. From Airtel Shops, Ben Chuanuka, Fubani, New Taxi Pack, or Majestic Brands Office in Bulangi Mango. You can also pay using Airtel Money. Dial star 185, star 5 hash. Kits purchased using Airtel Money shall be picked from Airtel Wampe or Shop. Paul is sponsored by. The Tales of Kasozi, brought to you by Uganda Communications Commission. Hello? Hello? This is Kasozi. How can I help you? Hey, Kasozi, my brother. Long time. We last met when we were at campus. It's been a while, but you are the person I'm looking for. Campus? Really? Hey, hey you don't remember me. Okay, so how can I help you? I'm stuck in Gulu making millions, and I need to urgently send money to my sick mother. Mm -hmm. But I can't find any mobile money agent near me. I've sent the money to your phone, as you can see the message. Eh? It might take a few minutes to come through, but I urgently need you to send the money to my mother. Let me send you her number, and you send it to her chap chap. Ah, my friend. I'm afraid your mom is going to die. What? Because I don't know you, I never went to campus, and I'm also in Guru. So can we meet at CPS? We talk about it. Stay tuned for what Kasozi does next. Tofira, refrain from unnecessary engagement with strangers over the phone. This message is powered by the Uganda Communications Commission. Are you tired of high fees and slow transfer time when sending money? Look no further. Airtel Money is here to revolutionize the way you move your money. We have revised our rates and now sending money from Airtel to other networks in Uganda, East Africa and to the rest of the world has never been more affordable. Plus, you can trust Airtel Money to get your money where it needs to go quickly and safely. Simply dial star 185 hash and start sending money. Switch to Airtel Money today and experience unbeatable rates and top-notch services for all your local and international money transfer needs. Airtel Money, instant, secure, borderless. We've got comfort replaces pain, peace replaces confusion, hope replaces sorrow. God loves you and knows you personally. He hears you and speaks to you in your thoughts, in your heart, and through living prophets. Come hear the words God has for you. Watch the General Conference on Sunday, 2nd of April. Jerry, 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 God! Jerry, 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 God! Hey, Master Blaster! Touch him, Anna! Bang, Jerry, can you use Master? Those ones who say go crazy for you only. Mudawa, Mudawa! Best school fees I teach you! But I'm going to go to the school because of the cover that is very far. Is you serious? Is serious, you? Ah, ah! What can I watch? Yeah, you stay put on it. Add kilometers to your legs and you get your sugar. We buy meat from Umaru and Umaru refuse to give you enough meat. Mama! Show him that they don't joke with you. Hey! Umaru, Oh, kaka luka no kurunji. Weta gako mtu wa kuyamba ko. No wecho, tuja kutera wembele sani de. Osoburu kukule chisinga. Awa muu, jeri chiturema. isn't just a girl. She is the future. This is a teacher, a doctor, a community leader, our future president. She is our family's pride and as her father I will protect her from child marriage and talk to her about the dangers of teenage pregnancy. We each have a role to play in empower. Are you curious about Uganda's third national development plan and how it affects your daily life? Then join us on Monday, March 27th, 2023 at 10 p.m. on UBC for a special edition. At winding this up out of the five series before we get to Vision 2040, where we're looking at transforming Uganda from the peasant uh, society uh, to a modern society. Uh, Mr. Charles Olenias, um, I come back to you. You earlier on talked about the issue of um, 
regional designs. And I would like you to take us deeper into the classification of these re uh, regions. What was your basis? And uh, because also that taking it now to PDM, many have asked the question, was it feasible to have 100 million shillings for each and every parish? You're looking at a, a parish in Kampala, you're giving it 100 million with all the population and everything. And then you're looking at a parish down in Masindi and you're giving it the same, uh, basing on um, what they want to deal in, the population and all those statistics. What were your very for the different classification designs of the different regions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Midrid. First of all, the, the decision to, to treat all parishes as homogeneous mm -hmm. was a matter that us as National Planning Authority had viewed as, uh, as going to be problematic. However, when the stakeholder engagements continued, it was then agreed that uh, for a start, we regard this as the first steps in the implementation of the PDM. Okay. Indeed, so far we have received the feedback right across the country that uh, this position needs to be reviewed mm. and it it goes further to remind us as 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 the the planning authority that there may be even instances where we shall need to review some of the the policies that we have and which actually government may be implementing some of them are politically very sound but realistically we have issues with them Mm. For instance, I'm just trying to bring this to make a point on the difficulty that has arisen in terms of regarding all parishes homogeneous. If you, if you have a, a policy commitment to say we need uh, a primary school in every parish, Midrid, uh, if you went throughout the country, there are going to be definitely parishes where you are going to struggle to put people together to feed into that one primary school. Mm. So I think what uh, will be important to note is that uh, even just like the PDM, at its implementation, we need to quickly be reviewing the, the modus operandi uh, for the implementation of the, 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 the PDM. It goes without saying that a parish in Kampala could have as many as, uh, uh, let me give uh, maybe 3,000 households. But you could go to another upcountry or a rural setting, you'll find that a parish could have maybe 150 to 200 or so households. Mm -hmm. So this is going to pose a problem. But nevertheless, we cannot just uh, pour away the, the good, uh, you know, the baby uh, with the dirty water. We are saying this is going to be work in progress we are going to continue engaging with the, all the stakeholders to so see that... So we should expect some changes. Absolutely. Mm. Going forward, there may be some changes because, I mean, it just makes sense that not the same amount of money can be going to parishes where obviously the, the population statistics, for instance, are not the same. Very different. The household uh, statistics are not the same. So this, I'm sure, is uh, something that is going to be reviewed as we implement. Let's get back now to the classifications of the region because Uganda is diverse. There, there is something unique about each and every region. Is that what you particularly looked at or what you, was your essence no, of this No, uh, Midrid, I, I must tell uh, the listeners that uh, there was no classification. That's why I have said that uh, the assumption of the parishes being homogeneous 
mm. was not perhaps very correct. So we need to go back into the, you know, to the drawing board and review this as we go along. Okay. Yeah. All right. Dr. Asuman, you talked about a very important aspect. And uh, if I could just take it to the statistics as late as even before COVID-19, a World Bank report that had placed Uganda's contribution of the private sector between 2012 to 2016 alone, and that is as far back as then, to about 800,000 jobs that had been created. Very key, as you did state, but suffering with issues of, for example, the cost of capital in itself. And you've mentioned um, a great percentage of the private sector being informal. What has been done to, in, to, to move the informality to formality? Because clearly many will tell you, I do not want to become formal because then government is coming to rip me off. And that is why they choose to remain in the dark. Uh, Mildred, again, thank you. And... Uh... In NDP3, you are right. Those are some of the things we are trying to unpack. Why is, some, why is the, the formal growing and it's not reducing? And how do we ensure that uh, we formalize the current businesses? And the way we are looking at it is, uh, again, right at the way I put, is one of the issues, not maybe formally, particularly, but mm. what is failing our private sector to grow is the cost of credit. Sure. Because uh, uh, currently, uh, a Ugandan borrows between 20 and 25% in the banks. And therefore, at that kind of, kind of rate, it's very hard to see a business that is going to give them a return above 20%. So majority of Ugandans, they, what they do, instead of borrowing, they decide to use either savings circles that those were in their own circles uh, they decided to to borrow from friends and relatives now what is living what is currently happening the reality on the ground that i'll tell you that we are seeing the economy is because of these high interest rates that it has structured the private sector from the productive areas mm. who is borrowing who is really borrowing? The people who are really borrowing at uh, people who are able to go to Dubai and trade, his traders, because uh, he's borrowing to clear a container. Okay? Then, two, people who are putting up apartments because there is a mortgage related to that. Mm. Three, uh, uh, people who are in service sector in particular. Now, as, as economists, and development, we will need the borrowing to be following where jobs we want the jobs to be. And these are agriculture, that is in industry. Now, the challenge with the current market is the challenge with that cost of credit is two, two for, on two fronts. One, on one side, it's very costly. On the other side, it's short term in nature. Mm -hmm. Short term in nature to mean that uh, uh, for somebody who is borrowing to do an agricultural business, you need a type of funding that's patient in nature to allow you to be able to start paying back after maybe two or three seasons. Because probably the first season is learning, you may lose that season oh, because of the drought. You're paying monthly when agriculture is a seasonal. Yes. That's, that's, it's, you, first, you'll pay monthly. That's what I'm coming to that. The mm. type of capital you need is capital that will allow you to to, to, to get at least three, four seasons, okay, before you start paying back. The current capital in the market now is that before even the season is done, before even the crop, start you start paying. So that's, that's not the right thing. In terms of development now, what we are trying to do is we are trying to unpack that to come up with patient capital. That's why you see uh, the NDP and including the budgets, we are trying to push for more uh, UDB, uh, we are trying also to look for other ways to make sure that we reduce the cost of capital, particularly you are, when you are hearing government trying to say we will not borrow next year. It's because part of that is to free up resources to in reduce interest rates, but going forward to try to make sure that the markets try to start providing for long-term capital in terms of, and that's why PDM becomes key again, because PDM is trying to sort out some of those financial challenges for particularly these small informal sector people. Mm. Now, coming back to the informal sector in particular, is informal sector beyond PDM alone is 
instead of government being a policing agent for the private sector, it should be an enabler. It should handhold. So, so the argument now we are having with the, uh, because you have so many government entities. On one side, you have Uganda Revenue Authority. On the other side, you have URSB. Okay? Uh, you have UNBS. Now, the conversation we are pushing from planning uh, angle is that instead of UNBS coming to police you for standards, it should come and support you to ensure that how do we support you to be able to, to adhere to the standards that uh, we are aspiring for. And if you do that, therefore, when the private sector, who in the informal sector, starts realizing that it's a win-win for all, there's something to gain from you growing. Because uh, the reason when you're in the informal sector, there are some things that you lose out because you can't grow a certain level. You can't hire certain people. Because when you start hiring them, they need NSSF. And for you to get NSSF, you must formalize. So you can't grow to the extent that you are growing. Now, we, need, we are trying to develop a package that is incentivizes the informal sector to be able to come out from their informality mm. in terms of also trying to reduce the cost of capital uh, for them to grow uh, to the level that we are aspiring. Okay. I can expect, um, Mr. Charles Oleni, before I go to Honorable Wanyoto again, oil and gas. I mean, it's, it's the excitement. 2025, we're literally counting down. But how prepared are we for this huge task that is ahead of us with all the discussions are taking us back, of course, to what I was saying, um, you know, environment and the issues, renewable energy uh, that are coming through. And aren't we taking a snail speed while conversations of renewable energy and oil and gas becoming obsolete are taking shape and center stage in the uh, global discussions? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mildred and viewers. First, I, I want to underscore uh, one or two things. The first being that uh, we are all aware, for purposes of planning in the country, yes, we do acknowledge the potential and the opportunities that we have as a country around oil and gas. The, uh, the precedent investments that will happen will bring in a lot of uh, growth potential, especially to the SMEs, if they are going to be able to participate in uh, the, the processes that are therein under the local content law. So we think that there, there will be opportunities and, you know, created for the young people uh, to get jobs, but also for the, the small and medium enterprises uh, to become active. But let it not be lost uh, to, to the listeners that as a country, one, we have paid great attention to the environmental concerns surrounding the exploitation of oil and gas. That's why uh, even through the entire process of uh, having to get the, the first oil drop, uh, we are careful to address along the way addressing all the environmental threats. The National uh, Environmental Authority has worked very closely and they are directly involved in uh, clearing uh, and certifying the, the, the planning processes that will see the oil uh, come out. But also, uh, as a country, we have not uh, over relied on the potential that oil is, is going to give us. That's why if you hear from the discourse uh, on oil, Uganda is believed to be taking extra caution not to put a lot of uh, emphasis and fail to plan for other sectors. So that when the oil comes, it's like we, we forget everything else and then we will be threatened to suffer what they call popularly as the, the Dutch disease. Mm. As a country, I think all plans are in place to ensure that we, we continue to plan very well for all the other opportunities that we have that will generate growth, that will create employment, uh, that will improve the household uh, incomes. That's why even now, as you see, 
the, the, the PDM and many other government interventions are all looking at interventions now that will address poverty, that will address income gaps, that will address uh, generation of jobs without necessarily focusing only on oil. So I think to that extent, we uh, as a country uh, are, in good, are in good space. But we How is the national database um, performing, especially looking at uh, percentages of um, uh, local content that we are emphasizing in the oil and gas sector? Yeah, so far I think uh, I cannot exactly quote the, the percentage. No, but no, I'm what, aware. what I exactly mean, I'm not asking you to tell the numbers, but are we on track with um, promoting um, local content because that has become a big elephant in the room? Or are we having um, a, a totally different foreigner fronting Mildred as a, one of the partners, but yet in actual sense, that is not what is existent, but using that as a ploy because you are looking at local content under the planning processes? No, I think uh, the, the regulator is doing a very good job. The, uh, the Uganda Petroleum Authority has undertaken a very systematic approach to onboarding the small and medium enterprises from within the country in order for them to benefit from the local content. And how are they doing this? They have since been engaging with the private sector to uh, educate and sensitize them on what is required for an SME to participate in the local content space. I am aware that there is a whole uh, list of so far certified companies that are local because remember the, the, there is a qualification criteria for you to be regarded as a local company in order for you to benefit from the local content law. It's very specific. So I think to say uh, uh, the least, we are again sitting very well in addressing our preparedness for the, 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 the local companies to benefit from uh, the, that law. Okay. Yes. Honorable Lydia, uh, we earlier on talked about the percentage of women, 51.5%. The lots that government has put in place, even under parish development model, a particular section, a percentage that is clearly and squarely reserved for women and youth. But we've had programs like uh, the Uganda Women Entrepreneurship Fund and all that. Where are the successes, where are the challenges, and where do we need to look as we also place the woman at the forefront in planning under NDP3? Uh, <clears throat> The biggest, the biggest strength of women now is the level of literacy. So ever since we began the UPE program, there's been big motivation for women to go to school, especially the girl child. And that is the first step to empowerment. The second one is the 1.5%, because many women now have been able to acquire some level of skill because of that additional affirmative action and uh, an attraction and motivation to literacy. Now, because we have more women who are literate now, they are able to even engage. Talk about your uh, IT and these, all these phones require that you know the numbers. Mm. You are pressing which number. You have your, your mobile number and even to build confidence. So we are talking about um, a growth over 60%. If you look at where we came from in 2007, we are doing very well in terms of uh, literacy levels, and uh, that gives women confidence. We even count money. Yeah? We, we are, women are no longer asking their husbands or their sons to count for them money. Mm. She goes to the market or she goes to this group because they're now in groups, and she's able to know what 500 is, what 1,000 is, what 20,000 is, and the value of it. And that's why many of them constitute uh, market. Many women in Uganda consider almost 45% of the marketplaces and uh, the, even the recent construction of many markets in these towns in Uganda. There has been that build up of new markets, big markets. You find that many owners of the stalls, uh, either whether it is fresh food or it's produce, or it's textiles, or it's saloon, the leisure industry, and then they, are, they have even improved the catering services. You know that these days we're no longer having just hotels. We have women who are supplying, who are
procuring catering services even from their backyard at home. Mm. So they have improved in issues of hygiene, issues of marketing, issues of presentation, and uh, they are able to, to engage and position themselves and compete, even procure in, in, a, in public spaces. I was able, we were able to do a study about who is supplying these big institutions with meals. Many of them are women, whether it's banks, I don't know who is supplying NBS, but many of them are women, mm. and they don't necessarily own big hotels. They just have restaurants, but they've been able to meet the standards of hygiene, and they have qualified and they've gotten licenses to deliver catering services, to deliver in the leisure industry. Many of them have also joined the entertainment industry mm. because they've been able to build confidence, literacy levels that can enable them to express themselves and to go out there and get. So this um, small money for small scale industries really capture almost 70% of women. Because women are not big capital people in our country. They do not inherit a lot of property. They do not have a lot of collateral because they don't own most of the land. Almost 20% of Uganda's land can be said to be owned by women, but mainly maybe three inheritors or those that have bought. So over 80% <coughs> is male-owned, and only women can use it for utilization. And when they use it for commercial crops like coffee or like tea, then they may take the, 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 the produce, the outcome of what she has grown for commercial. You go, you, you grow, you harvest, you weed. When the money comes, is the Hizan was signed for it mm. from the cooperative or from the society. But now, this new campaign of household income, of parish development model, is a big catchment area for women because majority of the women at the village level or at the parish level, given their uh, social constructed uh, model, role models in the family. Okay. They're the ones who look after the children, who, look, who keep the homes, who are in the community. So if you go down to the parish model, she'll be able to leave her house, walk to the parish center, get what to do to her, go back to her group, mm -hmm. and be able to do a cottage industry within the homestead. Either she's keeping chicken, or she's, really, she's looking after some cattle for milk or beef, or even tailoring, just within the homestead, within the village. And that is going to work for them. Because what, what they were lacking is a small trigger of income. Because they have the energy, they have the zeal, and they have, the, they, they have their own uh, passion to be able to earn a living so that they can supplement the efforts of their male or husband in the home. Okay. So therefore, if, for, for us to uplift these women, we are uplifting the country's basic unit, the basic unit of development, and before we know what, we would have captured the biggest population to be in the money economy. Because before we began this campaign, almost uh, about five, ten years ago, almost 68% of Uganda's population was outside the money economy. They, were, mm. they had nothing mm. to do with the money in Uganda. They were just off. Uh, they were in subsistence economy and they were not. They were poor. Eight, 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 six, eight percent. And, and, and of the eight, of the six, eight percent, almost fifty percent of them were women. So the mention of parish and village, you are targeting women. Women. You are targeting and you are uplifting the country's most valuable resource, which okay. are because a woman speaks to hygiene. Hygiene speaks to good health. Good health speaks to life expectancy. Life expectancy speaks to good uh, education to children and also the energy and life expectancy to their men. All right. So a woman is the rallying point for any development of any community. And also when you speak about women, you're talking about dependence on the environment and its ripple effects. But yeah. I'll be coming back to you. Dr. Mate, looking at some of the statistics, in the first few years of NDP3, we had um, envisaged to have a growth rate of about 5.2%, which didn't come to pass. We, had a, we were averaging at about 4%. But also, even when we look at revenue collections, which is key, because we're talking about a plan, but that plan has to be financed. And uh, we are still, even while we are getting our you know, internal revenue collections, we also have to depend on debt, which, which uh, Mr. Lenny was talking about earlier on. And, and looking at our revenue collection performance, averaging at 13.3%, still very, very low. How are we going to be able to see these plans come through, beat the, um, you know, the debt, 
the debt burden that we're currently um, ridden with and yet be able to fulfill them? Aren't we chasing wind or what is planned to ensure that these can be um, resolved? Yes, thank you. One of the ways we are looking at uh, being able to achieve growth with limited resources is to plan better. And uh, based on the experience of, of the first half of the NDP3, uh, looking at the performance, we, have de we decided that we do some uh, reprioritization. Mm. So we went through um, all the programs, looking at what are the most key areas that we can maintain over the next two and a half years to the end of the NDP3, and which ones can we move to NDP4? Uh, be, because we know that we are we are implementing in, in a kind of a, a cycle. Our aim is to achieve the results of Vision 2040. So even when we don't achieve uh, under NDP3, we can move some of those uh, interventions into N NDP4, uh, whose process is about to begin uh, in the next financial year. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, even before next financial year, we're already programming. Uh, but we have also looked at the need to do more in terms of uh, mobilizing resources. We won't sit back b because we, we don't have enough resources, so just say, let's continue with what we have. We are saying we do more uh, lo revenue mobilization, uh, be able to look at those areas that we have not done well, uh, the registration of, of businesses, the making sure that the digitization of the of the administration of of ura is, is well done mm -hmm. uh, making sure that we look at the incentives we have given out to some investors some of them might be uh, might have outlived the, the, their purpose so we are reviewing some of them uh, we need also to look at new sources there could be new activities because our economy is a, is a broadening so we look at the new sources of revenue but at the same time we have uh, other stakeholders that can give us uh, resources to implement the plan we look at the development partners the private sector under the private sector we still have opportunities of uh, the pu public private partnerships we haven't fully uh, uh, taken advantage of, of such an opportunity we have the development partners. We are looking at the framework we have with the development partners and see how can we improve partnership to make sure that uh, we attract more resources from uh, the, the funds that they have set aside. For instance, uh, climate financing. There are resources to finance um, the environmental activities for climate change. Uh, and other, other funds that are available. So we are looking at all these options and seeing mm. how can we utilize them to make sure we provide resources to implement the plan. Okay. So uh, the reprioritization and looking at um, improving administration of, of revenue collection, implementing our revenue mobilization, domestic revenue mobilization strategy, uh, leveraging the existing uh, partnerships with the development partners, and as well as the private sector uh, PPPs, public-private partnerships, mm. and other innovative uh, financing. Uh, of course, we've talked about the issue of, of debt. We recognize the fact that we had uh, borrowed from uh, both domestic sources and, and external sources. Sure. Both are important, but we are looking at uh, making sure that as we use them, we don't compromise, for instance, the ability of the local investors. Especially with the domestic borrowing. The domest yes. Mm. When we borrow domestically, we should be able to make sure that it does not compromise the ability of the private sector to invest. And, 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 and still at that very point, mm. you, you, you were talking about the other options of financing. Well, welcome. But currently we are stuck with two. It's either through tax uh, collections or it is either through borrowing. Mm. But when it comes to taxes, um, the Ugandan private sector has complained about 
uh, continuous tax deepening than tax widening. So it is the same small percentage of taxpayers, which currently less than about 3 million tax, uh, the tax base mm -hmm. uh, of Uganda, but 80% of those are individuals. And the same taxes will go to the same individuals year in, year out. Are we, how much more are we thinking about tax widening? Yes, we, we, we have recognized that, that uh, a few taxpayers, uh, those that have been paying well, we want to get more from them. Of course, that is a, that's the challenge uh, that we, we have also recognized. Uh, and that's why we are saying we need to do more to, to widen the tax base so that not only these uh, few payers are, are the ones that sustain financing of our budget. So, but we are saying... Uh, as we review the, the tax uh, policy and, and environment, let's look at, for instance, where we have taken away money from the private sector, especially where government borrows from the uh, domestic sources, we should be able to, to pay back quickly. Uh, sub, uh, be able to, to pay back more of, of the money we have borrowed domestically. Mm. Let us also uh, borrow more from the external sources because the cost is less compared to the domestic in terms of uh, um, compromising local investment. Okay. Besides, we need to make sure that it is more concessional so that the debt is sustainable. More concessional and more long term. Because if you look at the current status, in the recent past, we had uh, a rapid growth in, in the accumulation of, of, of the debt from about... 35 to about the current about 48 percent of, of our GDP uh, as debt, but it is still sustainable given the thresholds, mm. the, the parameters we use to assess uh, sustainability. But we are saying there is vulnerability uh, if we don't look at mm. our ability to service that debt uh, in, 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 in the near future. So we are looking at being able to borrow more of long term nature than short term so that the maturity in terms of maturity we're in position to service uh, what matures for repayment okay and uh, that we are able to get uh, debt which is at at low interest rate rather than commercial rates because the more we accumulate and at a higher rate the more difficult it becomes for us to service we need also to grow our uh, our local revenue our domestic revenue so that we can be able to get, when debt is due for servicing, for paying interest rate, we have money that can service it timely. Okay. We need also to invest in, rather promote exports, so that we are able to get foreign exchange that can be converted to pay the external debt when it's due. Uh, then achieve growth, overall growth of the economy. Because if you don't have growth in the activities, these activities are the ones that generate the revenue overall, that activities that are taxed to, to generate revenue that you can then use to pay back. So we are looking at the general environment for debt sustainability uh, so that we are sure that as we restructure our debt, reduce uh, domestic debt to more external debt, we also uh, reduce uh, from short term to longer term debt. Mm. Mm. Uh, but also we look at the issues of uh, growing uh, our, our, our income, uh, increasing our domestic revenue, uh, incre increasing uh, exports. Okay. So, and, and, mm. and looping in from where you said, let me go to Dr. Suman. Productivity and functionality, like uh, uh, Dr. Mate did talk about, for example, let's talk about agriculture, which is our biggest discussion in the country because of how many people are in. Let's look at the, MATIB, uh, the Markets and Agricultural Trade Improvement Program. We have 12 markets currently that are finalized, billions of shillings spent. Only eight are operational. We ask ourselves where we are standing. But also if we just look at the discussion we were having earlier, look at the deficit to GDP. You're moving from about 6.5% um, in 2020, uh, 2019-2020 to now 9.7% in 2020, uh, 2021. How are we playing the mathematics vis-a-vis -vis this, how we want to utilize the monies that we are spending with the plans that we do have to achieve the growth and productivity? It's an interesting uh, question. Uh, 
In fact, Madrid is like we are part of the conversation going on in government now. One thing on debt I need to point out is that um, everybody borrows, particularly people with smart ideas. Mm. In fact, some of us who don't borrow is because we are limited with good ideas. So if you have good ideas, in fact, in terms of the economics that we teach, it's uh, those with deficit of ideas we, we serve, then those with ideas go and okay. borrow to, yeah. in order to, to multiply that money. Mm. Now, if I come back to Uganda in particular, the debt, in Uga the debt we have in Uganda, the problem is not, uh, uh, it's not that the debt itself we are having. First, from that point, we must borrow if we have good investment what? Uh, ideas. Then the challenge is that the debt we are having itself is, its size is not the problem. The size, the problem is that the structure we have of the debt, majority of it is short-term in nature, mm. financing long-term investments. Two, it is long, it is costly. That one, the, the, the commercial debt that we are borrowing. Now, the question that we must deliver now is how do we first change the structure of the debt? Secondly, but if, where I come in more, what is that where Uganda, if you compare our debt levels to other countries, even the neighborhood, we are doing very well, we still have a challenge. This challenge for me, as a planner, every time you have a challenge, look for a positive from that challenge. Because every time you have a crisis, it's an opportunity actually. Mm. So what, are the, what is the opportunity that comes out from this challenge we are having? Is that while we are moving this debt, this debt has grown this fast. The issues that we need to go back on the drawing board is one, where are we putting the money? And this draws us back to the budget. If you are aware now in the government, the biggest conversation in the room is how do we repurpose the budget? How do we ensure, you see it in the newspapers, foreign travels mm. have now been vehicles mm. buying vehicles. Okay. Because now we are trying to unpack the budget to ensure that the budget is only for productive things. We would have never done this if we were not having that crisis. Madrid, every time you have a crisis, it gives you an opportunity to do things you didn't have done. Mm. So for us now as a government, is because of this debt, debt issue that we are having, it's not as bad as compared to our neighbors, by the way. But it takes us back to say, one, is make sure it is geared towards productive areas so that you grow the economy very fast. Secondly, we have been having a challenge in terms of uh, projects, the projects within we, the ones that we borrow for money. Is that you borrow money, uh, you start paying back interest before the project is, has started. Why? Because you did not plan this project well. You did not study this project. Now, because of this crisis, it has taken us to rethink a bit. Is that before we borrow money, we have to ensure that the project is well studied. It is going to benefit the economy. And uh, we have sorted out the glitches, like the glitches that are affecting us in project is land acquisition, mm. cost land acquisition. Uh, how do we sort out those glitches before you, you come in with the projects? Now, going forward, therefore, is that because of these challenges we are having, it is giving us a rethinking of how we use money better to improve the economy. Thirdly, in terms of agro agriculture that you talked about, and uh, agriculture being the engine of growth, it doesn't take any mathematics to realize that uh, the richer you get, the more you can afford to have more debt. I mean, you and me, if you compare us to Kin, Kin may have more debt than us, but mm. he will never run Sudiri, for instance. Sudiri's debt is much, much more than my debt, but I may struggle with my own debt. Mm. So the mathematics is very simple, is that if you are to, to be able to accommodate more debt, you need to have an economy that is growing much, much faster. And that one takes me to my first point when we started this conversation is that in NDP, the conversation is where should we grow the economy faster? And this in agriculture, it goes back and pack the entire value chain. Isn't that a mess yeah. to, to say where do we start yeah. on this journey? It's, it's because we have been having this conversation. So the question is that uh, if you have this conversation we have been having, where have you gotten it wrong? Mm. And I told you from the beginning that uh, when we are talking about agriculture, one, we normally talked about uh, production alone and not the entire value chain. Okay? 
And it's not that the markets are not there. The markets are there. But are you delivering the right quality? Okay. Are you having the right niche for the market? I normally, we have in this conversation, when you talk about coffee, hmm. everybody becomes an expert in coffee. <laughs> but what's our niche in the market? Thank you. Is, should our niche be the niche for Brazil? Should it be Ethiopian niche? Because Ethiopia, their coffee, 50% of their coffee is, is, is consumed domestically. Uganda, our coffee is just about 3% as consumed domestically. What's our niche in the market? So meaning that in terms of marketing, for instance, coffee, you, before you even talk of market like a homogeneous market, mm. define the niche for Uganda. Okay. Then plan backwards all the way to production to be able to deliver that niche. All right. That's the conversation we are trying to drive out. I, I think you bring a very good conversation, especially even with the markets that we are opening up, African continental free trade area and all this, we ask where is our uh, you know, advantage, where is our advantage as a country. Our time is really first spent, but I'd like to take um, a minute each at least for what are some of the recommendations as we move forward to concluding NDP3 as we roll, uh, roll out to NDP4. I'll start with you, Honorable Lydia Wanyoto. Uh, some of the recommendations include settlements. You find, it, coming from what you asked me about the environment, coming from seeing that our country has now have a little more energy in terms of uh, power and the fourth revolution of the communication, there is more urbanization going on. So we need to be very firm and strict with the planning in terms of physical settlement. Mm. You've seen, if you climb up to the topmost of, of, of NBS building, you'll see how unplanned the city is. There are so many slums, and those slums have a lot of unplanned, so they kill the beauty of a very beautiful country. Mm. And since we've had this um, planned uh, national, the industrial parks in our country, I think we should settle we should plan settlements so that the utilities are also planned. Let planned water, planned schools, planned health centers be in particular settlements so that we free land for commercial agriculture. I mean, th these are big names so that they are bigger ideas so that at the end of the day, even if you are, it will also help us to deal with the land uh, ownership and title. You don't have to own land and the title. But you can have a say on a piece of land mm. by what comes off the land, what is being sold off. Because not everybody can go off as a big commercial farmer. But if you can free the land and you remain with some level of a percentage of ownership, you benefit from the proceeds. Now this is going to take a big campaign because of the attachment, the cultural, historical attachment we have on land in terms of graves, where our great grandparents were buried. So you, you find that uh, maybe it has a small heart the other side looking facing the other side, then the one of uh, doctor is this other side, then he's so that you, you, you scatter a very valuable piece of land instead of freeing it for commercial agriculture and mm. you export, you, mm. you do the value chain, but at the same time you are settled in an area that gives you all planned utilities. There's electricity, there is water, there are schools, there is sanitation and waste management in one settlement area. This is going to take us years, but that, that's the best plan to we can have together. for our people and right. for the purposes of development and socio-economic transformation, including what you are talking about, uh, mindset change. We find out that people who have grown up in settlements, either in, in settlements like flats or communities of schools or, pol or military or security agencies settlements, when they grow up, they are more nationalistic in approach because they grew up with neighborhoods which are, which are not their tribal. They also have gone to the same schools, and they are, they are better managed in, for public management, for public life, than those of us that s stay grow scattered in our, in our small setting, and then you become inward thinking. Mm. You, all know, you only know your small tribe, and you only you know your own small culture, and you don't build onto the big picture of development and transformation. Mm, uh, you, you want to add on to that, and I'd also like you to give some recommendations. I just, I just, my, just want to give one recommendation. Yes. My last word for Ugandans is that embrace the plan, NDP3. This plan is not for, Uganda, for, you, for government alone. It's a plan for all of us. There is ev every in Ugandan, you will see yourself in that plan. If you, whatever you want to do, you want to maximize whatever you want to do, mm. 
just read the plan and get a niche for yourself as you expand there's room for every of us okay let us embrace this Thank Everyone you. is encompassed in here. Uh, Dr. Mate, what are some of your recommendations in this plan and for the Ugandans as we continue to follow up on the implementation? Because Uganda is not void of laws and plans, but the implementation is where the discussion comes. And the enforcement. Yes. Yes. The, the, the first one is uh, uh, at the level of the household. I think we need self-reflection at, at household. For, for people to ask themselves, where am I in, in, in the formula for modernizing the country, for transformation? Am I not going to be left behind when the country is getting to middle income? Am I benefiting from parish development model, from a MIOGA, from uh, uh, funds under microfinance, from the funds in the Uganda Development Bank? Let them ask themselves, where am I and how am I participating? At, at, at uh, another level, from the government side, we need uh, also to do more. Uh, we need to do more of the, we improve planning of the projects so that we can be effective in delivering them. Uh, of course, we have noted that uh, there are challenges with the designing them and making sure that we do uh, assessments, uh, feasibility studies. We need to make sure that we improve in that area. We need to improve also in terms of coordinating the program working groups that help seeing how the interventions are being implemented. Under the program approach, we have a number of implementing partners in a program. There's need for coordination, improved coordination at that program level. Because as, as money is allocated to a program, each stakeholder needs to come and justify the resources they need to implement their interventions. But at the same time, we need to, to make sure that everybody comes, is not left behind. The implementers are not left behind. Okay. We need to invest in information. We, uh, if you look at our recent uh, assessment of performance, we noted that we were missing a lot of data, uh, maybe because of uh, our systems not adequate to capture information, uh, data timely, like the surveys are not synchronized with the planning of, of the NDPs. So we need to do more harmonization. Mm -hmm. So improving data systems, improving coordination, improving project uh, management uh, will be important. Mm. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And Mr. Lenny, you have the last word, but in, the, in your few minutes, I, I, I would not like you to leave without speaking about one aspect that Uganda has been uh, very key about, that is import substitution and export promotion. But that putting in consideration, number one, the consistency of being able to provide these raw materials that are locally made, the case in point, uh, the Soroti Fruit Factory, yeah. but also uh, that some of our products that we use are imported, uh, the case in point for oil, uh, when the prices went up and we had, we said crude oil, I, I mean, had to come through, crude palm oil had to be imported from other countries for us to make soap, for us to make oil. But also talk about the digital agenda, our prices of internet, cost of internet, when we are talking about a digitalized economy. Yeah, thank you very much, Mildred and viewers. As uh, we draw down to the conclusion of this uh uh, Spotlight uh, Uganda program, I would like first of all to acknowledge as planners we work very closely with the Minister of Finance and a lot of what has happened uh, since we closely engaged with the finance, we need on this show to acknowledge the innovative approaches that the Minister of Finance has now taken on mm. because while we do the plan they do the financing. Sure. Recently, Midud, I think you are aware that uh, finance launched uh, the public investment strategy uh, framework, but okay. also uh, they, they launched the integrated uh, national uh, financing framework. All of this is already the way we must acknowledge what finance is doing to address the issues of how we need to deal with financing the plan without necessarily uh, increasing our vulnerability on the, debt, on the debt sustainability. So out of that, there are going to be a lot of instruments that are going to come out 
and at this uh, show allow us just to uh, encourage that finance goes a step further to operationalize some of the instruments that are in those strategies because that's the way we will get out of uh, the, the, the debt vulnerability as has been said. Uh, secondly, you, you also need to acknowledge that again you earlier referred to the, the markets, uh, some of which have not now been operationalized. The reason being that uh, as a country we have really suffered seriously out of this uh, project overruns. And again, <coughs> we want to agree with the innovative approach that has been now taken by the Ministry of Finance to uh, put in place the project, uh, of, uh, the, 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 the project uh, preparation facility. And actually, they hope to, to, to domesticate this in, in, in NPA. This is going to address a lot of this uh, sluggishness in implementation of projects. And this is the reason why we've been complicating our issues of borrowing and then you have a poor performing loan. So again, this is coming through very nicely. It is sitting right and it's happening at the right place. Uh, we need to embrace this and we're only looking forward to the operationalization of this and we get out and deal with efficiency of project implementation. Coming to the, the area that you've spoken to on the import substitution, I think as a, as a government, we, we need to be honest on how we want to uh, make import substitution succeed. Import substitution is going to require making reforms within the laws that deal with how we import the competing commodities or with what we hope to produce locally. If this is not addressed, we are just going to be talking around and going, you know, it will be a merry-go-around. If we have said that, uh, for instance, that uh, NITIL has to be supported, then we need to find a, a, a way in which we deal with our heavy importation of second-hand clothes. Mm. If we are saying uh, Soroti uh, Fruit Factory must be our point of uh, import substitution for juice, then we have to deal with how uh, does juice, whether pulp or what, come into the, how does it come into the country? So unfortunately, if that space is not well addressed by necessary legal reforms and policy reforms. We are going to continue to uh, struggle. And then finally, on, the, on this issue of import substitution, we must acknowledge that we have not invested enough. We have done some investments, but not adequate, adequate. to uh, empower such industries to be uh, sustainable. So that's what I would really conclude on. But over and above, I think as National Planning Authority, we want to appeal to the country to first value the plan because it's important as it guides the private sector interventions, government interventions, but also the development partners interventions okay. into our development agenda. Mm. And also, uh, secondly, in the plan, it, it assigns responsibilities. You have the, the ministries, the departments and agencies having, being implementers. They have specific roles that the plan envisages them to uh, execute. Mm. But most importantly, we as citizens, we also have specific roles that we need to undertake. For instance, there is no way government programs are going to be of impact if we shun them, if we don't uptake them. So it is a call therefore on all citizens that development as a process is going to involve and take all of us 
to act together. All right. Uh, well, it's only time that is against us, but thank you very much, uh, Mr. Charles Alinea Jock. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rogers Mate. To you, Honorable Lydia Wanyoto, always a pleasure. I think we are about to give you a, an identity card for next media pack. You're on the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And thank you, Dr. Suman Gulova. Great discussions. I think we need to have more and more of these. There is a lot I know that we've not explored. But like Dr. Suman said, there is something for everyone in the National Development Plan 3 and all we need to do is to embrace, seek out as much information and uh, be able to engage in the performance, in the rollout of um, uh, these programs also and implementation. As we get to Vision 2040, who doesn't want to live in a middle income status? We have to bring this to a close. I want to say a special thank you to Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, inspiring Uganda UBC TV that brought to us live these together with NBS Television uh, right here. We were coming to you live from the next conference center at the next media park. I remain Mildred Tohaise. I think it's in order to say good morning to you and God bless you. Yeah, it is already. It's already midnight. Curious about Uganda's third national development plan and how it affects your daily life. Then join us on Monday, March 27th, 2023 at 10 p.m. on UBC for a special edition of Spotlight UG. We shall, among other things, be exploring the successes, opportunities, and challenges presented by the NDP3's goal to increase household incomes and improve...